Um, my name is Eileen Murphy. I'm going to serve as moderator for the forum today. Uh, there was going to be a few members of the press in attendance. Any press here? Okay. We just like to know where they are and who they are. Um, and the Versher Select Board is who agreed to host the forum today. We appreciate the use of the Versher Town Center building for the afternoon. Um, I'm going to ask the Select Board to stand over here and introduce them. It's um, Ken Bushy, Nicole White Fogarty, and our chair is Vern Stone, who is going to give you a brief welcome today. I want to welcome you to the forum. Um, biggest thing is, let's be respectful for everybody. Um, the candidates are all up here. I'm glad. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, that's going to mean quite a lot. Um, so, let's get started. You took half my words. So there's no sound system, so let's be respectful. Please avoid side conversations with your neighbor. The candidates are going to project their answers out, and this does work for our annual town meeting, which is held in this room every year. And hold off on any cheers or jeers in support or opposition to a particular point. Um, I'm going to keep time for the candidates for their responses. Um, we expect the formal question and answer session to last about 30, 35 minutes. Um, at which point we'll take questions from the audience. So be thinking about your questions at this point to keep it brief. The questions will be worded to both candidates as opposed to an individual and direct the questions to the moderator. We want to be efficient and allow for as many questions as we can get in as possible. Um, there are refreshments afterwards, so please do stay and we will end on time so we can have further conversation over goodies. Um, as we do the questions, we'll be alternating back and forth as to who goes first and who goes second um, and keep that flow going so it's fair. We're going to go ahead and get started. Each candidate will make an opening statement of one to two minutes. Uh, the moderator will then pose a question to the candidates for each race. Candidate responses will be about a minute with a limit of two minutes and be giving them a 20 second warning. And we're going to do two rounds of the prepared questions after the opening statement. So we'll go ahead and start with opening statements and we're actually going to go in the order of Senate, House, Sheriff. So we're going to start with John Clark. He's first. <laughs> oh, I'll stay sitting. Hello everyone, my name is John Clark. I don't have uh, past representation like Mark, so I'm sort of new to this game. But my primary issues that I'm trying to, my, my main platform are issues that would find that middle ground that would allow Democrats and Republicans to work on the issues that are most important for Vermonters. And we have a lot of issues that have been dividing people, but I've focused on trying to make Vermont more affordable, to do the things that I can actually do maybe as a senator and try to uh, bring down the, some of the excessive taxes and electric rates and other things that I've been writing and talking about to help fix the pensions that I've actually been writing about for years with my background as a tax attorney, not admitted in Vermont, but I study finance and that's why you'll find that I've been writing for years that these pensions are insufficiently funded and have been mismanaged and that pits our state workers against our taxpayers. There isn't a side in that. We all have to come together on that and other issues. And uh, I also have a history of working in um, opioid recovery and treatment and as a criminal defense attorney and I think that brings uh, skill sets to this town and others related to tamping down on crime while still being compassionate to people who su struggle with substance abuse. And uh, these are and some of the other issues that I think that we're going to have to address as a priority. And also very much part of my platform is to help local farms and businesses, but particularly food. Our food insecurity is going to rise. Food inflation is going to increase with the ongoing prices of fuel and fertilizers. Vermont has a unique play, place to uh, play a role in that nationally, uh, but also it will do more to help the environment to improve our agricultural and regenerative practices than all of the other renewable programs combined. And that's something Vermont can take a leadership role in in the country. And by the way, it's something that Democrats and Republicans can very much and very easily agree on. And we have a lot of people moving here who are young people who want to farm, uh, Jay, and, uh, and we should help them. But meanwhile, a lot of young people can't afford to be here. 
And uh, that also is going to be an issue. So these are the things that maybe Vermonters of all people can come together instead of the red-blue divide and try to work together for the things that will most help for most people. And that's why I'd ask you to look at my platform. Thank you. Mark? Well, um, in the red-blue divide in Vermont has been um, hard to find. The Senate Appropriations Bill passed 30 to nothing. The bill that restores pensions and makes sure that they are paid off by 2034 passed 30 to nothing in the Senate. It also passed after the State Employees Association, the administration, the teachers, the Secretary of the Treasury, and others came together and put together a tough plan that will eliminates a, uh, any underfunding in the pension plan and sets out a schedule for that. Um, that is the issue that that needs to be dealt with. Um, any laws pertaining to that would be undoing what has already been done. Um, electric rates in Vermont are worthy of discussion here. They're also <laughs> along with uh, heating, heating issues and, um, and transportation um, costs. We are looking today and this year at the doubling of heating costs, the double of transportation costs, and one of the few area bright spots is electricity. And I hope we'll have some questions to talk about how those things ought to be addressed. The legislature spent two years coming up with a Global Warming Solutions Act, which was a exercise in planning how to deal with energy costs. Then it passed a uh, a clean heat bill, which lays out future planning on how to deal with electric energy costs. But none of the actions necessary have taken place. Um, hope, also hope that some of the issues that Mr. Clark has brought up in his, his, bro, his uh, mailing, such as um, McDonald voted to increase heating taxes, which is there was never a vote to increase heating taxes, no one in the legislature voted to increase heating taxes, and there was just simply no such thing. Well, I was surprised to read that and some of the other items that may come up here Thank in you. the next few minutes. Thank you. Who's doing the signaling on the time? That would be me. Okay. <laughs> then we will have to be talk, doing, looking at the audience and looking at you. Thank yep, you. We're yep. doing just fine. Yep. You guys are okay. Um, Samantha LaFay. Thank you very much. I'd like to start off by thanking you all for coming and for ORCA for making this available for those that could not come today. I'm Samantha LaFave. I'm one of the two um, current House representatives for Orange County District 1 for the towns of Chelsea, Corinth, Orange, Berkshire, Washington, and Williamstown. I was assigned to the committee that was part of the redistricting that now makes Orange County District 1 Corinth, Orange, Berkshire, and Washington, and I'm very happy um, that we were able to meet the needs of some of the towns around us and their asks. I am a wife, a mother, um, I am a landlord. I work on the maternity unit in Burlington. Um, that's where I take care of uh, people after baby, you come in when your baby is two hours old and I take care of you also if you have any high risk. I am the assistant to the director at Little Flock Nursery and Preschool and I also teach the one and two year olds there. I have a vast background of um, problems that all Vermonters are facing and I have a true respect for um, all um, people that are here with different um, maybe opinions or ideas of what I have and I am proud to say that I am able to bring things to the middle for people to be able to know that their voice is being heard. Um, I'm asking to be reelected to be able to continue to support um, our rural voice in Montpelier. Sometimes it's easy for some of the bigger numbers and the bigger population areas to get things that we don't get here and I do not let us get over sought. I make sure that we get fair funding and I make sure that we um, do not get skipped over when it comes to projects like bridges, roads, culverts, um, and paving. I'm also on the select board in the town of Orange um, and I was a former EMT and firefighter and I grew up in excavation and logging. Um, I'm very, very proud of what I do. I'm very proud of where I am from, um, and I am very lucky to be able to represent you folks in this room, and I continue, um, I'd like to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, George Contois. Thank you. Aren't, aren't you going to do the state rep candidates <laughs> first? I apologize. That's all right. <laughs> it's okay, Carol. I'm not going to let you go down. I'm not going to get my names and not my notes. I'm sorry. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carl Demereau. I live in Corinth, and uh, I previously served in the House during the 2019-2020 biennium. Uh, I would like to serve as your state rep again uh, to work on uh, a number of different issues that face the state. I think the biggest issue facing the state right now is the issue of workforce development. We need uh, teachers, we need machinists, we need nurses, we need carpenters, we need police officers, and many other um, folks in the state to fill the jobs that we have um, that are going, going left unfilled. And uh, we can't solve that problem without solving the issue of childcare in the state and without solving the issue of housing. Um, if we're ever going to get our workforce problems taken care of, we've got to deal also with childcare and housing. Also want to work on moving our state's economy away from uh, dependence on fossil fuels and moving towards uh, uh, the future economy, which will not be much more based on electricity and moving to update our electrical grid. Um, I'd also like to work on uh, being sure that we are always finding ways to make health care more affordable and accessible for all Vermonters. And uh, right now I'm also serving on the, on the Corinth Select Board. Uh, I also ser serve on the uh, Clara Martin Center Board, the Blake Memorial, Trust Blake Memorial Library Trustees Board in East Corinth, and I'm a longtime volunteer and board member at uh, Northeast Slopes. That's all right. George, come please. Thank you. I'm going to be brief because I lost a crown, and every breath is exciting. <laughs> I mean, I didn't really lose it because I know where it is, but I don't think I want to use it after this. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'm a born native Vermonter, born in Colchester, Vermont. I was educated at Rice High School and St. Michael's College. I graduated from St. Michael's and. Um, Went, the, uh, went to the Vermont State Police. They had an, a barracks fairly close to St. Michael's College, and I walked in there one day and um, talked to some of the gentlemen in there, and I decided, being 20 years old, 21 years old, that it was far more exciting with a nice, powerful car and a gun and a uniform as opposed to sitting in front of some snot nosed kids. So that's how I started with VSP. And uh, for the next 28 and a half years, I stayed with the Vermont State Police. I performed every job that they have from uh, trooper first class all the way to commanders and stations, commanding up to 27 people at one time. I was the uh, head of a drug force both in, uh, in the state as well as in the federal government. I worked for the DEA in Burlington. Uh, we went all over New England, did cases all over New England. I, uh, I ran off with my captain's wife 47 years ago. We have two, lo <laughs> two lovely kids. We still live in Orange. Uh, we ended up buying most of our family farm. My wife was a farmer for uh, many, many years here in, uh, in the town of Orange. Um, and what I want uh, most, most of all would be to see uh, a community type policing whereby you will actually see a car in your community, not just flashing through your community if you, for instance, haven't got a contract. That to me is despicable. So that is going to be my emphasis. It's going to be uh, deliberate, and it's going to have to deal with the contract issues. So I'm, I'm very eager to talk to anybody they want to talk to about contract issues, the problems we uh, experience with the contracts. I understand that they're, uh, they're necessary, but I think, I think we can do something more along a, a cooperative system as opposed to individual towns and uh, you know, assessment of hours and what have you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, Sheriff for 15 years now in Orange County. Um, I will continue to work with community leaders, our legislators, and citizens. Uh, as role as sheriff, I look for grants. Uh, in this past two years, we're able to um, obtain two grants, one for about 98000 for our radios, and another one just recently we approved for $115,000 to upgrade our dispatch center. Um, as many people may know or not know, uh, the state police are having a big issue with uh, dispatching and we're looking to pick up and expand our dispatching um, to help offset the cost of the county, the county funds. Um, I will also be working, continue to work with um, 
the education of children and the public on fentanyl, on the opiate crisis that's going on in communities. Uh, fentanyl is, as many of you know, it's very deadly. Now we have uh, rainbow fentanyl that's been entering the system. It looks like Skittles. Um, I'm going to continue to work, you know, with all our partners in um, state police, FBI, DEA. We're also going to continue to work with our schools, civic groups, churches on the, on the addiction crisis. It is huge. And, you know, we don't want to see people sitting in jail because they have an addiction. We want to get them help and making sure that those wraparound services are there. Uh, in the last two years, many of you know, COVID hit. Um, having those local connections right here, um, actually in, in Randolph with um, the glove company, um, I worked with Sam Hooper. We were able to come up with some uh, initial uh, cloth masks. Um, so working with our commu community partners on a very serious issue, we were able to continue our jobs. We didn't stop one one bit. We kept we kept providing law enforcement services during the height of COVID. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it. We're going to switch over to questions, and we have one question for each team. The uh, first folks to go will be the senators, and we'll start with Mark McDonald, and then after he speaks, John Clark can speak. Um, so the first question is, please outline some actions or options that would improve or strengthen the local economy. How to strengthen the local economy. Vermont spends $1.45 billion, $1 billion a year on fossil fuels for heating and on fossil fuels for operating motor vehicles. And the, of that money, forgive me, a billion point four five dollars goes out of state. And every time you purchase heating oil, you purchase propane, you purchase um, natural gas, that money goes out of state. The, the amount of money that goes out of state for heating that could be replaced with other heating sources is staggering and it drains this state's economy. Refitting people's heating systems with heat pumps, with lanai's, with um, um, electric heat is a job creator in this state. Producing electricity from solar and putting it to work to do functions that, that fossil fuels use puts people to work in this state and generates um, jobs in our economy. Weatherizing homes, we put $90 million aside to weatherize homes in the state of Vermont to use less electricity, less, less um, fossil fuels. We do not have the workforce to do that weatherization. So right now that money is going to colleges, um, trying to convert people that install um, oil, oil facilities, uh, oil burners, et cetera, to switch over and participate in renewable stuff. And that will also stimulate the state's economy. That's one example. Um, I'm sure several others will come up in the course of a discussion about um, changes to our, our fossil fuel use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to repeat the question, please outline some actions or options that will improve or strengthen the local economy. Well, that's a great question, and Mark, thanks for highlighting the differences between how we view these. I've studied economics for a long time, and you help an economy by increasing production, not increasing services, and many of the things that my opponent is talking about don't actually generate any real growth. Uh, the short-term installation of products does not create jobs other than short-term, sort of like EV5 and uh, JPEAK. You know, it has short-term employment, but not long-term. Long-term employment in Vermont could be farming production. We are not meeting the demand for the out-of-state demand for our products, particularly meats. It's not just about milk. There is a huge demand for local Vermont brand names. We don't have enough processing facilities. We could do more for distribution systems. We have a lot of young people who want to do it. Why would they invest their trust fund or other money here when taxes are so high? 
So I proposed a specific policy. I have 14 pages of what I call the Farming Manifesto. I produced it two years ago. How it is that we can take the ideas actually of a guy named Wendell Berry and apply them and stop making it artificially impossible for local people to produce food. We are dependent on faraway food that's produced with large amounts of fossil fuels that I agree we need to reduce the amount of use of, uh, of toxic food from China, from out west. And the more those costs go up, the more our local foods become competitive again, and we should help those businesses. And that's long-term growth, not just a blip while you install a heat pump. Also, as far as renewable energy and heat pumps, and Mark said at the outset that there was uh, that the clean be uh, heat bill was passed. I don't believe it was. Maybe you misspoke. But you did call for a tax on heating oil. If we were to eliminate the taxes on not have a heating tax on oil to try to incentivize people who can't afford it, not incentivize people not to burn wood, and eliminate the net metering program, which even the DPUC and many electric utilities agree, has saddled Vermonters with about $40 million a year in extra electric rates to help other people buy EV cars and solar panels, that's regressive. That's not progressive. If we put that money back in people's pockets, they can afford to live here, their kids can afford to live here, they can put it in the real economy, supporting local businesses, restaurants, and others. And, thank and you. sorry, thanks. I could talk more. Yeah. I'm like, I went from Jay. Everyone up here. Can. I'm sure. So thank you. I didn't see the signal, so you got to wave your arms more. I'm, well, I think what I'll do is I'll say time and that'll Give you You'll know you have to wind it up in 15, 20 seconds. I just don't like to interrupt you with speaking. No, so I, 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 will, I, I will go ahead and do so that I, for you guys so at least you know. Um, so for the House, um, the question is, how would you promote an increase in housing opportunities to address low-income and middle-income affordability, new residents, workforce, and vulnerable populations? And we'll start with Carl Demereau. Thanks. Um, this is a huge problem in this state, and uh, as I mentioned before, we're not going to get our workforce uh, issues taken care of if we don't deal with housing. We have a very powerful housing uh, um, agency in this state called the Vermont, uh, the Vermont, Ho Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And the legislature is supposed to fund that board with 49% 40, of the property transfer taxes that are generated in the state. Unfortunately, the legislature over the past uh, period of time has used that money from the transfer tax to make the budget look balanced so that VHCB has not gotten its full, full allocation for housing. And that's a problem. That's a good reason a good chunk of why we are where we are today. We've underinvested in housing uh, with money that we should have been putting in from the property transfer tax to VHCB. Now, VHCB's programs are very good, but they tend to be geared more towards large developers. And we need to have VHCB have a program that works with smaller folks who are dealing with infill type developments in town and, and community centers. Perfect example of that is Jonah Richard and Fairley. So he's developed an eight unit, uh, three story building next to Chapman's that some of you may have seen. Um, he's a 30 year old guy, very smart, but there is no one else like Jonah in this state. And we need to be creating a program that is going to, to, to create more Jonas basically, or we're not gonna get our housing problem solved. If we're just focusing on large developments, we're gonna only be doing those, that work in bigger towns and we're not going to solve our housing issues without, as I said, dealing with infill type developments in smaller town centers and village centers. Thank you. And um, I'm going to repeat it because it's a bit of a question for Samantha. How would you promote an increase in housing opportunities to address low income and middle income affordability, new residents, workforce, and vulnerable populations? Thank you. Um, I wholeheartedly agree that the workforce is where we got to start um, building this from. Um, I went to Essex Tech, which is in um, the town of Essex, and I went to the Career Center there. Um, when I was there, there was a wait list for kids to go, and unfortunately, that's not what it's looking like today. We need to be able to encourage kids and students that they can go and that they can have a career and they can make a life for themselves and get them into the electrical, the plumbing, the craftsmanship. Um, we um, supported a, a part of the budget. We gave $137 million for workforce development. And one of the most proud things for me when I was reading through that was that we are inventing or setting up 
um, a slaughtering and butchering apprenticeship down here at VTC to be able to bring some of these things back in. Um, but we also allocated $338 million in the past two years into affordable housing and shelter space. That's an estimate of 4,000 new housing units. My husband and myself um, owned a business and we delivered bread, um, the bread you'd see on the shelves. We sold that route um, and that time I did employ people and we bought another one. With the money that I sold the route with, I bought an abandoned house in Barry City. We've been using our own two hands, um, no grants, um, to be able to bring that back up. So it's taken extra jobs and doing extra work. And I go and I find people that would usually not be um, eligible for housing due to their credit, due to their past rental history. And I give them an opportunity to have housing that they can be proud of and housing they can feel comfortable in. I'm a strong supporter of being able to give people housing with dignity. Um, currently, um, before, currently, we're spending six to six um, six and a half million dollars per month for people in hotels, and that's not okay. Number one, that's cutting down on our tourism, um, and it's not a sustainable place for these people to live. I believe that we need to be able to keep um, making uh, options for uh, people to be able to build and to create and recreate with things that we have here, and to be able to create more options for people to have affordable housing that they are comfortable and confident in. Thank you. And um, starting for the sheriff question, what do you see as the role of the Office of Sheriff in Orange County in relation to the towns? And we'll start with Bill Boniak. The relations with, with the sheriff with towns is you know, building, that, building that community base and working with you know, all, the, all the different towns, all the different leaders with the select boards and you know, with my, with what George mentioned earlier about contracts, we, I wish we didn't have contracts because each town is different. Some towns have very small contracts and they're, they're difficult sometimes to manage. And when you call for police services, you want someone to respond, no matter what it is, whether it's a mailbox vandalism or something very serious. Um, the contracts, they vary. Um, i could just give you an example for the town of Randolph, the village of Randolph. It's 17 hours a day, seven days a week. And then you take another town, Williamstown, it's 30 hours a week. Other towns are anywhere from eight to 10 hours a week. And you have 168 hours in a week. You know, we try to have one deputy take care of three towns or, or four towns. But that's basically a 40 hour, 40 hours out of the week. That's he's, he's covering, could cover three towns. So um, we must look towards our legislators and look for a change, and also look for other ways to fund um, these patrols. So it's it's not an easy position. I've been for 15 years trying to work with different towns. And right here in Verschier, we right here in Verschier, we have had an issue, and um, it doesn't mean that we don't come into town. We we have been in town here many times for many serious calls. That's myself, my captain, and uh, other deputies who happen to be going through when there's an incident going on, or if they're close by, they respond. Thank so, you. Um, how do you see the role of the Office of Sheriff in Orange County in relation to the towns, George Contois? Well, the object of the game is uh, protection and serve. And um, when it comes to the contract, unfortunately, we're a size 44 trying to stuff into a size 32 pair of pants. We don't have enough people to maintain service uh, to the rest of the community. Just in the last week, we had two serious crimes, right, one of them within a thousand yards of the office, and we couldn't supply an officer. And it was ridiculous because I was five miles away on a contract, and another contract, uh, he, he was over in Thetford, and on the contract I was on, there were seven people standing in the middle of the road down here on 113, and you folks know what 113 has been for the last two years. I couldn't leave for that because if I left and anything happened to any of those seven people, what would happen? We'd all be sued. It would be a, be a terrible tragedy. So there's got to be a way to get around these contracts 
Uh, and there's got to be a way that, that we can protect and serve. There's got to be a way that we can do this financially. And I'm suggesting that perhaps a cooperative between the existing towns might be the answer instead of um, individual towns trying to set up uh, uh, you know, a contract. Now, as far as Vershire goes, God, we've had a lot of time in Vershire, but I don't know as it was patrolling. I've sat out here in Vershire hour after hour after hour after hour on a contract that lasted two years with sometimes as late as 12 hours a day. Now, that's a lot of money pouring into the department. And my question is, where is all that money, and why can't we get additional people? Why can't we get different cars? I, I, was di I hate to go into this, because I, I, I don't want to go into any, anything disparaging, but the cruiser I was running, it was uninspectable. It had a rotten frame, headlights out. And it, it was just terrible, and I, I went to my supervisors repeatedly. So it's a money issue. But I, I would like to look at a cooperative issue between all the towns splitting the county in half. Work on it that way. And I'm sure it can be done. I'm sure it can be done. Thank you. So we have another round of questions for the three candidates before we go into the opening up for folks for the Senate. Um, and we will start with John this time. Um, please outline your approach to stormwater and water quality management. Where's all the select board people out there? Ditches. <laughs> Well, that's a sticky wicket. Um, you know, at both the state and the local level, uh, a lot of it is about affordability. Uh, the Lake Champlain waterhead, watershed, which is one of the biggest problems, was going to cost an estimated $340 million. And those costs were being put on, on a lot of businesses who literally was going to put them out of business. And so I argue that that was an unjust taking of money from them. These are businesses that have been operating for many decades, particularly down in Rutland. And so the money should be procured, and there are federal dollars to do that. Uh, Vermont has actually made a lot of great strides in agriculture, uh, like with sequestering carbon and reducing um, energy inputs. Agriculture nationally, that's the number one area where we can make a big difference. And Vermont has actually made great strides in that area. Uh, fewer strides, perhaps, have been made in new developments in some of our, some of our larger um, urban areas. And so, uh, again, an integrated approach that includes not only the, the, the professionals, the people who study water and water quality, uh, but also making it more workable and not simply saddling businesses and private citizens with costs they don't have. It has to be, uh, if we're talking about economics, it has to be uh, doable and affordable. And we've also had problems, and I think I get a strong endorsement um, as a, you know, I'm a conservative, but I'm a conservationist and have been my whole life. We have PFOAs and other chemicals that have leached out of manufacturing industries. They need to be regulated. Uh, one of the number one things we could do to protect health is to remove uh, the, the contaminants in our water supply and in our food supply, which our pharmaceuticals and our food supply, the stuff we ingest ends up also in our water system. So a comprehensive approach actually would, I'd come back to regenerative farming and more organic food again that I think we can supply to a lot of, are you interrupting me now? 20 seconds? Is that the 20 seconds? All right, that's good. That's what I asked you to do. So, you know, we could do a lot of that to, again, bolster small farms. We could be producing a lot more of these organic foods, not to make it mandatory or just about organic. Locals better than far away, whether or not it's organic versus conventional. But we could supply our hospitals, our prisons, our, our armed forces, our hot, you know, uh, any, how about the state house with locally produced foods? And that may not sound, uh, that's it, that will immediately also do, uh, address water quality issues. Thank you. Um, Mark McDonald, um, uh, please outline your approach to stormwater and water quality management. Stormwater. It rains a lot more and a lot heavier than it used to, which means the current practices and the current machinery doesn't do the job. One of the things that has been done, and the highway department here in, in Berkshire would know better than most, is we are no longer directing the highways to get water downhill as fast as possible, which means you've got to stop deep ditching. You can't shoot water down as fast as you can. You have to build settlement places for the water to settle in, go into the ground, and not go downhill fast. The cities, which are getting bigger, used to get, used to get federal revenue sharing to pay for 
stormwater management. The federal government no longer does that. It stopped revenue sharing in the 80s. It cut taxes at the top end for very wealthy people. It brought tax rates from 90% at the marginal rate down to 37%, and the federal government does not have money to help towns, cities, the way it used to with stormwater. The, next, the other problem we have with stormwater is when it rains and the water goes into the city system, it overwhelms the sewage treatment plants. More stormwater comes in in shorter periods of time as the climate pr produces rainfall at greater, um, greater amounts in a fewer number of hours. Cities are trying to separate stormwater from the, this type of water that goes in the gutters that usually would just go out in to be treated on soil. It is expensive, and as my opponent here mentions, it's based on property taxes now. Property taxes pick up the cost of stormwater. So you've got a problem without a funding source, and I would ask any one of the folks here, what is the funding source for stormwater? Requiring farmers to, to till differently, to do no-till planting, allows more water to be absorbed in cornfields, in uh, hay fields, and in farm products. Thank That's you. one way to deal with reducing stormwater from agriculture. So we're going to move on to the House and start with Samantha Lefebvre. Uh, what steps would you take to support small town infrastructure going forward, specifically roads and buildings? Thank you for that question. Um, so throughout my time being elected, I have attended the select boards um, for the for all the towns. Um, and if I couldn't miss them, if I couldn't attend them in person and I miss them, I would review the minutes um, or join remotely online, um, which is a very good blessing for people. Um, I think of the six towns as my six children and it's important that I'm very active in all their lives. Um, and it's hard when you hear things come up um, that they didn't get the funding they anticipated. It didn't make the budget. And it's something that it's important when you are back in Montpelier and I'm advocating for back home, um, that that money is going to them and that they're getting what they're promised and that they're getting what they've anticipated for the times to come. Um, making it available for towns and um, small towns that do not have the best support for writing grants to get that and for us to be able to meet the towns where they're at. Coming out and doing site visits, following up and being persistent. Here in Versier, um, I'm not sure if there's people from, I know there's people from out of town, if you're not familiar, they're trying to revamp their, um, their garage, their state, their, their, I mean their town garage and the salt shed. The salt shed is currently sitting on the bank which could easily go into the river. We don't want that. Um, so I have been very active with um, your select board here and with the town to see what I can do to be able to make sure that that funding comes through and that some of the struggles that they're facing due to regulatory, um, due to inspections, and due to things that are just out of their control are not, not obtainable for the town to be able to get the resources it needs for the material and the equipment that you've already purchased and take care of. More things going forward is, you know, equitable funding, even regardless of the population for towns. Just because you don't miss, hit a certain quota or just because your population isn't the same doesn't mean that the town residents are not deserving of that same protection and, and funding for towns to go to be able to go forward. Um, and it's imperable that I speak and whoever represents this town speaks with the um, town clerks and the select boards to see what they're at and what the best position we are in to be able to help them. And again, making sure that the voices here are not forgotten about and that we bring that money back home and make things um, obtainable regardless of how big or small we are. Thank you. Um, so uh, Carl? Um, what steps would you take to support small town infrastructure going forward, specifically roads and buildings? Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I think would be important is updating the town highway aid allocation. That's one thing that hasn't happened in a long time. And in a town like uh, Vershire, where you've got about half the number of um, residents as a town like Corinth, but more or less the same amount of miles of town road, uh, it really adds to the town tax burden. And I'd like to see the town, aid, town highway aid allocations um, uh, updated. Uh, I think that the legislature passed uh, H518, which was a weatherization for a municipal building um, bill this past um, biennium. 
that's a good step forward, but I'd like to see that, that sort of a program uh, continued. And that, that's going to be money for um, weatherization and fuel switching for municipal buildings. Um, like like uh, Samantha, I also worked with the town here uh, back when the uh, original town garage um, location was up on Durgan Hill. Worked with A&R on, on that issue, and, and uh, I know how frustrating that was for the town. Worked with the select board, came to select board meetings, um, and also uh, stood in this, in this room right here twice uh, during town meetings to hear what are you going to do about uh, Route 113? And um, <laughs> I remember asking, uh, asking Steve Ward, I said, Steve, you're probably not going to vote for me, but what would you want me to do if I got elected? He said, fix the road. <laughs> and uh, so, so I became a squeaky wheel for that. And um, I don't know that it made any difference or not, but I really stayed on the folks at, um, at Vermont uh, Agency of Transportation about 113 and really impressed upon them that for most people in this community, their daily drive on Route 113 is their interaction with state government. So I would take that same, uh, same um, sort of uh, attitude uh, towards serving in the legislature again. So we'll go to uh, sheriffs and start with George uh, Contois. Identify and prioritize some effective strategies for keeping our communities safe. Well, education is probably the most important aspect in, the, in, in that uh, we know that, for instance, fentanyl has killed already 177 people this year alone in Vermont. 177. If you if you even knew how many people were uh, resuscitated with Narcan, it would it would just shock you. And so, if I mean, if you're going to make a good communist, you've got to start right from the beginning. You need to be you need to be uh, employing an officer in a school. You need to have classes. Um, that are geared towards, um, you know, drug uh, problems that you see everywhere. And if you think that you haven't got a drug problem in Verschier, you're probably wrong. Um, as I said, I worked for the Drug Enforcement Administration in Burlington for a couple of years. We went all over the country, and I was, I wasn't shocked, uh, uh, you know, after about six months to find out just what was out there. I mean, we were buying kilograms, kilograms, 2.8 pounds of cocaine at a shot right here in Vermont. So, that, you know, where is all this coming from? Uh, are our kids uh, being indoctrinated by their fellow students? You know, is there any way that we can get to them early on? Because if you don't get to them early on, you're all done. You know that as parents, if you let your kids run wild till they're 12, you're not going to have much luck with them when they're 15 or 16. So you need to work, you need to have education, you need to have funding for that. Uh, I, there, there are grants, and we've been fortunate enough in Orange County to, to receive a couple of these grants in the past few years, lead for, lead for one. Uh, and you know, we had a person that was dedicated to that. And, and unfortunately, that, that is gone now. But it, it was a wonderful course, and the kids loved it. And these kids are going to grow up to be sitting in the same chairs you're in. So it's your community. You need to make these decisions early on. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, Bill Boniak, identify and prioritize some effective strategies for keeping our communities safe. Yes. The LEAD program is not dead. It is alive. Yes, we lost one of our, one of our people. You know, he moved on. However, he's still, he's still working teaching DARE. Uh, not DARE, I'm sorry, LEAD. It's Law Enforcement Against Drugs. It's an evidence-based program that uh, has really taken over the, lead, the DARE program uh, in a lot of places in our country. And they do focus on uh, drugs, alcohol, bullying, and violence, which is, you know, which is really important. And having that, and we went from four schools, we were teaching, we are 11 schools. Um, so even right here in, in Westshire, um, we want to continue that, and uh, one other thing, just real quick, I know I'm going to run out of time here, is that we must keep everyone aware of this fentanyl. It's now to get this rainbow fentanyl, they're pushing it out to, throughout the country. Over, over 10 million pills have, received, have been seized in the last week, 10 million. 
And you imagine how many got through. So we, hit, we need to wake up the public, you know, making sure our children are, are fully aware that these, these aren't Skittles, these are dangerous drugs and they will kill. There's no doubt about it. Um, you say where it's, where it's coming from. Right now, the cartel out of Mexico is the number one provider of fentanyl in this country. Um, the other thing, I'm gonna back up, backtrack a little bit, is that uh, we have 15 vehicles in our fleet. And out of the 15, we do have what they call line cars, and that's what George was talking about. We don't put those on patrol, we use them for doing traffic control. So 14 of those vehicles, are, they're not paid by any taxpayer money, period. They come from these traffic control details we do. So that's where a lot of the money is going. And you think about it, $50,000 for a vehicle today. And currently, we, get, we cannot purchase a Dodge vehicle until after the first of the year on a commercial program. Thank, Thank you. you. So we want to switch over to audience questions. Um, please raise your hand and be recognized by the moderator. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd state your name, first name, or first and last, and your town, because there are people from several towns around. Ask your question briefly, worded toward both candidates as opposed to an individual person, and we're going to try and balance the questions so they don't go to all to one particular race, House Senator, Sheriff. Who'd like to start? Michael Taglavia from Corinth. Um, it's to either House or Senate candidates, whoever would like to answer. Um, for years, we were told that forest products were renewables, um, and we're hearing now all of a sudden that everybody needs to switch over to electric. Uh, I live off grid in Corinth. Um, what are you going to do about my wood stove? I heat primarily with wood. Are you going to outlaw my wood stove? And also, um, I enjoy walking through the woods with a sugar maker in the spring. Are you going to tell the sugar maker that he can't use either oil or wood to make his maple syrup? And are you going to try to put that industry out of business? Uh, we'll start with the house, and first up would be Carl. <coughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm also a sugar maker, and I also eat with wood. Um, I harvest wood off of our property, take my tractor up in the woods, fell the trees, pull it down, skid it out, bucket, split it, and that's the way we get most of our heat. Um, here in this part of Orange County, we will sometimes encounter bills that are from uh, 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 other parts of the state that may not take into account the way that we live rurally. And uh, I'm not afraid against voting against those bills. Um, I did vote uh, for, to remove the two cent tax on off-road diesel a few years ago when I was in the House because off-road diesel was being pegged at that point as a heating fuel, which it isn't. Our loggers, our excavators, our farmers depend on that fuel for their livelihood. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take away your wood heat. I'm not interested in doing that. I am, however, interested in finding a way to transition much of our economy away from fossil fuels. And whether there are ways to do that, I'm all for that. But another example is the Rygate uh, plant. The Rygate plant needs to stay open. It needs to stay open so that we have a market for low quality wood in the state and we keep our foresters and our loggers uh, employed and as long as they've got a market for low quality wood, they can grow higher quality stems and we'll have a, a vibrant uh, forest products industry in this state. But once that market goes away for low quality wood, there's no longer any incentive to weed out the poor stems in the forest. And then we end up with a, a less, less high quality product available to the forest products industry. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Mike. Uh, thanks, Mike, for coming out. Um, so I, I, um, I do not want to take away wood heat. Um, I do not want to mandate or force or take away anything um, from anybody. I believe if you can afford to make the switch and you'd like to have um, you know, a reimbursement, a rebate, if there's something to incentivize you and that you are in that position to do that, then I will fully support you in what you'd like to do. But I believe that the government should not be telling you how to, what, how to heat your home, what to do, and where you're at. And I know that this winter is going to be very scary for many people, um, and I do hope that there are resources out here for people to be able to heat their homes however they need to to stay alive. 
um, is something that's very serious, um, and that I do, um, I, I do understand that while sometimes it is um, hard once you are in Montpelier to be able to um, vote how you would like, I do appreciate the liberty that I have, that I'm not told how to vote. Um, I do what you guys asked me to do. Um, I'm not um, hard-armed by my party. Um, I have the liberty to do it as I was like with um, no, no hardbacks on me. Um, I have, um, I heat my home with wood also. Um, my oil tank currently is below a quarter. I cannot afford to fill it up. Um, I am making sure that my tenants have the heat in their home first. Um, I do support that, uh, um, I did vote to, and I um, argued on our house floor for us to keep Rygate open and to make it more accessible for them um, and to not shut them down. Um, so that way they can take the lesser quality wood to be able to heat and also in Burlington where they use wood chips. We need to be able to be supporting our loggers. It is an industry um, and it is something that keeps us going. Um, anything that you see and anything we do, we need to be able to be able to process, process more of that here. And that is how we can also cut down on some of our climate um, <clears throat> changes that we're having is by processing more here, bringing back our mills, bringing back us being able to harvest and, you know, make our own timber here. Um, those rough cut boards, um, you know, be shut down so many of those areas that people have now had to ship their wood out of state and we need to keep that wood here and we need to um, be supporting that industry. Yeah, I'm, uh, this is a broader question than just uh, Vermont policy. I'm Mark McKay, and I wondered, if, and this is a question for both the House people and the Senators, and a yes or no answer will suit me. The first is, do you think the 2020 election was fair and that we have Joe Biden as a, a duly elected president? The second part of that is, do you believe in the separation church and state. And you <clears throat> through that, if you expound, that's fine, up to you. And we'll start with Mark McDonald. I believe Joe Biden was elected president, he was a legitimate president, and um, I believe in the separation of church and state. I it's the Constitution, and I've sworn to uphold that. John? Five, twenty seconds on so I certainly believe as an attorney, uh, I graduated near the top of my class at UConn, not here in Vermont Law School. I think it's a unique distinction of our country, and I very much separate, uh, agree with the constitutional principles of separation of church and state. I have been disturbed about our elections, uh, the, the weaponization and polarization on both sides. I don't think that uh, those seeking sensible voter IDs are out to exclude anyone. Uh, we do have voter fraud, as I've documented. We've had some voter fraud right here in Vermont. As far as nationally, I certainly do hope that we have integrity in our system. I'm certainly running in one in which I hope that I can trust my Secretary of State and otherwise. But if you haven't seen the documentary 2,000 Mules, I suggest you look at it. Uh, Polls show that a majority of Democrats who watch it recommend that other Democrats watch it. It raises some very disturbing questions, not about a government conspiracy to influence the election at all, but about private interests who did apparently commit fraud. And that, as an attorney, and looking at the evidence, I hope it's not true, but I have concerns about how we're going to safeguard elections going forward. So I'll take that as a no. I don't think he's a fair election. Oh, no, I, I don't say that. I, I think that there are, there are uh, attacks on election integrity that should concern all of us. And I, and I, I wouldn't say it as a yes or a no. Um, I have trusted the election results. I'm not going to do anything to change them here in Vermont nationally anymore, and I'm going to fix inflation. But I do think this is a middle road to both protect people's rights and, 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 and prohibit ballot harvesting, which people have done and, and are doing in this state. And, uh, getting votes from people who are uh, not qualified to vote. So I, I do think that there's a balance in the middle that we should strike for, both well, nationally and locally. John, if it's not a no, then it's um, a yes. Hang on a second. Is that correct? Word questions are going through the moderator. This is not a back and forth discussion thing. I'm curious, though. It's um, a yes or no question that was asked. You know? it's, it maybe is not an option. I mean, I, I want people to look at the facts for the themselves. The candidates respond how the candidates wish to respond. <coughs> Thanks, there's honey. a question, there is an answer. I'm, I'm, so, uh, is there a question before we move on for the sheriff's race, just to keep things balanced? Hi, my name is Emma, and I live in Berkshire. Um, my question.
questions around mental illness um, and how mental illness contributes to criminal behavior, and I'm curious what the candidates would like to do about supporting mental illness and resources for that in our community, because I see that as a huge uh, issue that law enforcement could be more involved with. Thank you. I think we're starting with Bill. No, you're absolutely right. There is a correlation, and we deal with it almost on a daily basis. Um, that's where we, we we try to get the help right from the very beginning. We go to a call. We're calling ahead for, for Clara Martin Center. Depends where we're at. Um, if it's in the Williamstown area, we're calling someone out of, of the Barry area. But we, it's it's here. It, we're dealing with it every day. Every day we're dealing with some sort of mental health crisis, and one of the one of the areas we we normally get called to is actually um, the hospital, uh, Gifford Medical Center. Uh, when a person gets is out of control, we we're there to calm the person down. That's what we do. We we calm the person down. We don't we don't go in and try to escalate it. We want to just diffuse the situation and talk. If it takes an hour to talk to somebody, that's what we're going to do. Well, we have training on, on mental health that's available to all the deputies. But um, My first station was in Middlesex, and we had the Waterbury State Hospital in the backyard. And so I learned a very, very, very uh, long time ago that uh, uh, mental health problems uh, become community problems. And we had people that would walk away from the hospital, people would go up on the interstate without clothes. Uh, and, you know, you have to be... Um, loving and kind, you, you, you can't be bullish with these people. And we do use all the facilities that we can. Normally we would take them to a, a, a hospital. If, if, if it's obvious, a mental, if he has a real mental problem that's obvious, uh, it's probably easiest to head to the hospital and one of the, the workers from um, mental health will meet you there and the, the physician there can help you out. That's, that's fairly common. But uh, mental problems are any, they're anywheres and everywheres. Even on a car stop, sometimes you know people will be just livid and and you know being calm and realizing that maybe they're not you know uh, I shouldn't say both oars in the water, but you know they're they're mentally ill and you have to treat them with you know kind hands with ginger hands and you can re usually resolve the problem right there without having to take anybody anywhere. But there are those folks that you just absolutely have to um, get them to the hospital and get them treatment. Thank you. Another question? I do actually have some more questions, so if people are happy, I'll use them. In back? Hi, yes, my name is Rita Seabolt. I'm an abortion. I'd like to ask that. I'll stress uh, their stand on uh, abortion and their stand on the uh, amendment to the Constitution, and um, keeping abortion free from us. And we'll start with Samantha. Um, thank you. Um, so the question that you're talking about, Article 22, it was known as Proposition 5 in the House. I did not vote to support it. Um, that does not mean that I um, do not support uh, people's rights. As I said, I work on the maternity unit in Burlington. Um, I think the language is not going to get us where we're going to go, and quite frankly, it's going to turn the decisions of what folks are doing to the courts, which is exactly what just came back from Roe versus Wade, even though it came back down to the state level. Um, this is going to make anything that is not clear go to the court's decision, and that's not where it should be. Um, I understand that there are some times that a pregnancy needs to end. Um, I do not believe that abortion um, should be a form of birth control. Um, but I do understand and respect that sometimes people are put in positions that the baby, um, that, that life um, cannot survive. And I do not think that taking that access or right away, I do not believe in um, not allowing abortions across our state. Um, I'm seeing people come in all the time and the fear in their eyes. Um, you, we treat you where you're at. Um, if you've been through that, you've had to make that decision. Um, <clears throat> I do not support late-term abortions. But I also do understand um, that sometimes, as I said, things, things occur. Um, I voted no on the language, really, because I do not support the language that there is. It's vague. Abortion is nowhere in that language. That word abortion is nowhere there. It's more about um, other things that cannot be answered. Um, I sat through some the, all the public hearings for that um, during my time in the session. I went in when they had held the public hearings. Um, and there's many questions that came up to that committee as well that could not be answered. They said the courts would decide. No, like this is this is us. And people should be deciding. 
Um, and so it, to me, it's a very hard, I'm a hard line to go. Um, you know, I've sat with women that I've made that decision and I've cared for them and their families. Um, and I've sat with people who have wanted a baby so long and the baby, you know, just last night we had a fetal demise. Um, and you sit with them as they're holding their baby. Um, it's a very, it's a very hard topic, um, but people deserve to be loved through it all. Carl? Thank you. Um, a few things on this one. Uh, I voted for Proposition 5 when I was in the legislature. I also co-sponsored and voted for H57, which was the bill that gave women in this state the right to an abortion. Um, I am going to vote for Article 22 when it comes up on my ballot, and I'm going to vote for it because the Supreme Court in June decided that women are second-class citizens in this country whose rights can be decided upon by the states. And I want to be sure that this state gets this right. I disagree with Samantha about the language in the article. The language in the article creates a very high bar for the state to infringe on a woman's rights. And uh, if I am elected as your representative, I will continue to steadfastly uh, protect the woman's right to make her own reproductive health care decisions in, in uh, concert with her doctor. And I also want to say that of the two of us in this House race, I am the only one that is endorsed by Planned Parenthood of Vermont. That's correct. I am not. I will not seek that endorsement. Another question. I just want to know your positions on uh, social justice and equity, restitution, and critical race theory. So, um, did you guys hear that question well enough? Okay, I'm going to start with the Senate, and it would be John Clark first. Could, could we, you repeat the question, please? Go ahead. Yeah, I want to know your positions on um, uh, social justice and equity, uh, restitution, and um, what was the other aspect? Critical, yeah. Critical race theory. <laughs> okay. That's a compound question. You could add a few more <laughs> items there. Uh, I've been very outspoken. I'm an MLK guy. I believe in equality. And equity, as Thomas Sowell has written very extensively, and I, I highly recommend him. He's a brilliant man. Equity is always advanced at the expense of equality, and it creates new inequities. Critical race theory is Martin Luther King upside down, and it says that we should judge people based on their skin color instead of their, car their character. And uh, we see that resulting in new inequities all the time, and Vermonters have seen that in Vermont, where money under COVID was distributed to sole proprietorships who were BIPOC, but not people who were white. Um, I'm attacked as a racist for questioning it, but I believe in free speech and that we need to have really important discussions about such launches into ideological fantasies that are not supported by the facts. I oppose talking, uh, calling all of our police racist for arresting people who are of color when in fact the drugs are coming from the inner cities where I used to practice criminal defense law on behalf of gang members and blacks and Hispanics who were my clients who I completely gave all of the rights to. And uh, my son from my first marriage is 20% Nigerian and was actually called racial epithets. That doesn't mean the system is racist. Vermont has a tremendous history of abolitionism and fighting against racism. We, we voted for Obama in the highest numbers in this country. And we elected the only black man in the country to our legislature prior to, um, to the Civil War. So I don't deny that there is racism, but I don't believe that the answer to racial disparities is either to assume that all racial disparities are due to white people being hateful or that government is going to implement new uh, racial measuring sticks and new discrimination against white people to somehow make it better. It creates resentment, it creates division, and it's highly inequitable. It, it, it actually is counterproductive. So that's my very, I've written a lot about it and I continue to study And I got an A in social justice in law school. And I've studied this extensively in the urban problem in okay. undergrad. So. Critical race theory is a, a course that's taught that examines how laws in the past have discriminated against black people. So 
Um, I, I honestly, I don't understand the question. I know we have issues with race, that we continue to treat um, people of color differently than white people are treated. Um, when we do it, we feel bad about it and think it ought to stop, and it continues. Um, if you look at people who were pulled over, um, it, it, not me, if you look at the state police looking at its own practices, it says, my goodness, we pull over people of color more often than um, we pull over white folks. Um, and yes, why? And um, they can't come up with any reason. They weren't driving any faster or doing anything any different, but that's what they do. And that's a problem that um, we have to resolve among, you know, and, and, and bring to an end. And we haven't figured out how to do it yet. So I, I don't, it, it, it makes us feel uncomfortable when we're reminded that that's what we do. And I say we as a, a society, that's what we do. And um, we ought to stop. We haven't figured out how to do it yet. Other questions? I don't actually have a question, so I'm asking permission from the moderator just to um, make a couple of comments about the world around me as I see it. Um, just for, I'd rather take some questions and then get okay. that until later. Thank you for asking. I appreciate oh, that. You're so welcome. Hi, I'm Cheryl Calhoun, I live here in Hershire, and um, one of the things that I find very concerning is the lack of affordable housing and the cost of property taxes, and I'm wondering if there has been, a, um, current use was put into action 40 years ago to keep large spaces of Vermont green, but has there been any consideration in changing that just a little bit so that there are decent parcels of land to be purchased, such as the example of the town of Vershire bought a piece of land that was not developable for our town purposes. So um, as a person looking to downsize, I can't find anything to build for myself, a, a decent piece of land. So how are um, developers, that, like that small developer in Fairley, going to find decent property to build affordable housing for, for, for folks down the road. And is there, um, is there a potential of looking at current use for um, maybe not necessarily to maybe pair off a, a, you know, a small parcel of land without having the huge tax benefit, the tax penalty, or putting in a clause about people get that benefit if they're truly using their land for farming purposes um, rather than people who come up and buy land and put it in current use and not have to pay as much taxes as I do for my house and my five acres of land. Um, so we'll start with the house and so this is specific to affordable housing and current use and Carl? So uh, really interesting question. Um, the current use program was created to uh, provide tax breaks to people who kept their land uh, in use for forestry or farming. And there are requirements that come with getting that tax break. For example, if you do have your land in forestry, uh, you need to have a forestry plan for it, and the forestry plan must require uh, harvests from time to time. So it, that's a current, it's a currently a forest use. If it's in farming, it must be producing crops or um, or doing something of agricultural value to the state economy. So the, the purpose of the program is to generate uh, economic activity. Your question about housing, I, I think, is a, is a really interesting one. And, and the, the current use program changed a little bit this past biennium, where a, uh, a provision was made that a certain amount of land could, within a certain size piece, and I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, could be set aside as sort of a forest reserve, a sort of a uh, bio reserve that also um, sequestered carbon in, in trees. Um, I think that the housing problem is not necessarily going to be solved out here in our communities. But 
I think that's an interesting question, and I think it's a question that uh, I'd be willing to look at if I was in the legislature. And, and uh, whether it's a, a matter of changing, um, uh, adding additional two acre, two acre plots that could be taken out um, for uh, housing without paying the, uh, the full penalty or only a portion of the penalty, that's, I think that's an idea uh, worth considering because we it's got to be all hands on deck for this housing issue. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. <clears throat> Part of what uh, Mr. Demerel was referring to um, that we did in the house was H six nine seven, the use value appraisal program, um, and it was talking about reserve forest land. And I um, wanted to veto that. I did not uh, support where that was going. Um, it was wanted to go towards um, having old forest. Um, and not that we shouldn't preserve, um, but a, a little background, if, if a tree is up, it's doing the best that we can to be able to absorb in, and it holds. If you cut it, it holds. If a tree falls on its own, it releases everything that it's had inside of it. The exact opposite of what we want. I don't want to drive around looking like um, you know, swamp lands out here. We have beautiful forest. We should be planting more trees, and it, that's how it should be. I do agree that there's too much regulation, and that needs, it's not a cook, you know, a, a cookie cutter fits all. We have people that are in different situations, um, and I do believe how you enrolled, you should be, act, you know, talking with your forester. And if there's, if you are in the situation yourself, that is a job that I can also help you with, looking at options and what you can do, and to help. You know, we connect those dots, um, and that is something as a representative um, that I take serious is reaching is communicating with residents um, and constituents about any problems that they're facing, where they feel like the state maybe really isn't hearing their side of the story. Um, but I do not think that we need to be as regulatory as we are, and that we now are pushing ourselves in a corner that we can't back ourselves out of. We're saying that we need this, and we do need help, and we do need housing. We do need more places for people to come. We need more people here. We have more jobs than we have workers for. Um, but we also need to be supporting our workforces and supporting our local businesses and protecting ourselves here more. Um, but I think that is a great question, and I do support where your question is coming from. And if you have any need any help after, please let me know. Uh, somebody had a question for me. Sheriff, sure. I'd like to get a sheriff question in if I can. So, okay. And then I'm going to come over here. So I just heard you guys talking about fentanyl lead and how those go hand in hand. I have a 10 year old child in Westshire and I've heard hearsay and I don't know how true it is and I hope you guys, maybe Ms. Fail can name on it, um, that the lead program will be removed from Westshire. Um, it seems like that we should be having a lead program and you're talking about the program as well, continuing. So how does discontinuing a program in a school at that age level appropriate? We'll start with George. The majority of my work has been lately contract work. So it's difficult for me to be able to answer that, except previously we, we did have a, an officer that was working with lead and that was his primary, his primary job. He was doing a great job at it, and he's, he's moved on. So as far as I know, um, there, hasn't been, there hasn't been much done. I'm not sure if the schools are being uh, serviced with, with the, a lead program. At least I've heard, uh, I haven't heard anybody talk about it. I walk in the office continually, and I, and I see boxes of, of uh, material that's supposed to be I assume disseminated to the kids, uh, you know, helmets for their bicycles and stuff like that. But I don't see the box dwindling, so I'm not sure that they're actually doing anything with lead. But we certainly need a lead officer. But where are you going to get a lead officer? Are you going to take a guy offline to have him work in the schools when you haven't got enough people for protect and serve? Uh, you know, you, it takes a special type of person to be with kids all day long, or even for a two-hour class or whatever. But as I said, if you don't reach them early on you're not going to reach them. So that's a, that's a really, that's a, a viable program. You know, we need it. I just don't know how you could do it. Uh, I unfortunately don't have any access to the financial aspects of the department. I'm kind of like a mushroom. Uh, I, don't, I don't hear much. Uh, I don't talk to our accountant. Uh, I don't talk to the sheriff about how he spends his money. That's, that's, I'm just not privy to that information. 
So it's hard for me to understand, do we have a, uh, an officer, or don't we have an officer, or can we get an officer? Uh, you know, I, I have no idea. I have no idea how Thanks, we're going to solve that. Thank you. How's that? Perfect. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Bill? <laughs> yes, we, we have more than one lead officer. We have, there's three, three all together, and first off, we, we got to get the schools to be on board, because if the principal or superintendent doesn't want it, it's not going to happen. Um, that's where, you know, parents like yourself, you want, to, you want this program in the school, you have to, you know, talk to the teachers. We primarily try to do fifth grade, two years before they go into seventh, so before they hit that junior high school. So fifth grade is a target area. Um, the LEAD program, we, we were trying to do it on the COPS program. It's a, a federal grant. It's a four-year program. And um, the officer um, George is talking about is Ken. First name's Ken. He, he was doing it for more than four years. Actually, he was doing it for about almost, almost eight years total. But you know we're we got the cops grant. We're we're working on it again. We're going to bring it. It's approved. We just got to get it back. I don't know if if you're not familiar with the federal federal grant system, it's a little complicated because it's it's all no paper. It's all everything done on the internet. And we've been having um, if anybody deals with the federal government, there's issues. So we're going to bring the cops program. It'll it'll be back. We're able to to do a 40 hour a week uh, position where that's a community officer. Um, the helmets that George is talking about, we have been giving those out on a routine basis. We do bike rodeos throughout the county. And uh, just recently we, we have a Facebook page up. It's been on the Facebook page and we've been uh, handing out quite a few bicycle helmets uh, in the county. Um, I want to go back to the uh, critical race theory. Uh, number one, as a, a person of color in uh, Vermont, um, and Mr. Clark was saying, well, you know, we're better off in Vermont, and I can tell you if you're not black, you don't know that. Because, I, you know, when people tell me, uh, I tell them the problems that I have had with people trashing my house and leaving junk in front of my driveway, you know, um, that's Vermont. That's the, we're still part of the United States and that problem still exists and it's deep. And you know, I love being in Vermont. I think my Berkshire Wright friends will tell you I'm involved, I'm engaged, and uh, I plan to do more volunteering by the way. Um, but there is a problem and the critical race theory is nothing more than telling the history of BIPOC people. That's all it is. And uh, I, I've been in, living in Vermont since 96. I still call myself the perpetual tourist because <laughs> everybody asks me where I live when I'm here or Sorry, where I'm shopping. And there's a question. Yes, there I, is a question. I know there is. <laughs> yeah, and you know me. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, let's get that straight right now. Critical race theory is not, and it's not even taught in elementary school. It's been blown way out of proportion. I have seen the woman who, who wrote the book, 1612, and if you talk to her and read that book, like he recommended the documentary, you will learn a lot more. My question is, I have gotten stopped by one policeman in, uh, by the Orange County Sheriff, and after that stop, I said, I will never go to that office again because I have not been treated that rudely since I was stationed in Texas. I am a retired Air Force officer. I taught uh, uh, first grade overseas for 16 years, and I have consciously made, I have traveled the world in many places. I constantly, uh, consciously made Versher my town. I want to know what's going on with uh, training people for diversity. I know about fentanyl. I don't have that problem. West Shire, I, I did teach school, but I don't have any children. But I am black, I am in a white state, and I want to know what's being done on that level. You know, that I don't even feel safe in my own, own house anymore. Especially since the Trump era. 
Mm -hmm. um, giving everybody to go ahead. I'm going to direct the question about that to the sheriffs, and we'll sort Whoever you want. Why do I want to thank you? <laughs> yes. Um, if it, I, I can't change the past, so if that happens again, you know, anyone in the room, you got a problem with one of the deputies living now. We, we want to know about this. And we do, we do teach the, the, the deputies diversity. And actually we, myself and a few other, a few other deputies on the other side of the county, we, we've been working with our local, they're part of the NAACP, it's called FOUR. It's Focus on Racial Equality. So we've been, we've been working with the group over there um, when we had a, a protest um, that happened in Randolph Village, we had no issues whatsoever. We were right up front. We, we, we offered our assistance to help them if they needed roads closed, whatever they needed. But, oh, you know, okay. I hear you. I'm glad to hear that. And you know I, what happened in Brightford also when they tried to have a little in there oh, about that. Right. No, my next question is how much uh, diversity training do they have and how often? It's usually once a year. For anywhere from two to four hours. Thank you. May, may I? Great, thanks. And yes, your turn. Well, everybody had to take uh, a diversity class. Uh, I forget how many hours it was, but it was at least six hours within the last year. Um, and it was a very good class. It was taught by a, a, a UVM instructor. She was, uh, I think she was from Chile or, or someplace. She was. She was a terrific gal. And it, it was enlightening for a lot of people, especially the older folks, the older troopers and the older deputies. Uh, you know, I say older, you know, people in the 50s or whatever. I'm careful here. Yes, um, do be. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there is training, and everybody that I know is sensitive. They're very sensitive to the issue. And if anybody, if I was a supervisor at the time, and I've been a supervisor for a long time with the VSB, and if anybody walked into the office or wrote a written complaint on an officer that did anything as crazy as what you're talking about, we would have a long discussion, very long discussion. Uh, at least when I was in the VSP, we worked under uh, a U.S. Marine Corps, uh, you know, regiment, and nobody asked you, you were told. And if you didn't do it, you had a problem. And that's the way it should be. And Bill was right. You need to, if you have a complaint, you need to uh, vocalize it. Otherwise, we don't know. People put garbage in your yard. We pondered around, played in the garbage before, and we'll play in the garbage again to figure out who owns it. And they'll get that back plus a little bit of paperwork with it. It's, it's, it's something that we're doing, believe me. I don't know, I don't know how you fell through the cracks. And if you did, um, I apologize personally. I didn't feel comfortable going to the sheriff's office. Mm. Mm. Well, still not. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the dispatcher can be cranky. I'll agree with that. I'm sure Bill will too. Uh, <laughs> if you experience that crankiness, once again, we need to get a hold of somebody, supervisor, so that we can rectify that problem. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Burnstone, Bershier. Um, you say that you don't have your, your down officer that teaches this lead? Lead. Or, what? Lead. Lead. Um, why does it have to be an officer? Why can't it be somebody that's, that's trained to do this? Um, well, I'm actually going to start with George and let him respond to the questions because that's how we're doing this. Well, it's a good question. I'm not sure I can answer it properly. Perhaps Bill can, but I, I'll take a shot at it anyway. Um, I'm not too certain that you have to be a law enforcement officer to be in the league. I know they employ a lot of civilian people because uh, they have a website. Um, and having a civilian on board is, is uh, certainly not a detriment. I don't see any reason. In fact, in fact uh, you know, some people, uh, school board members or, or parents, don't really want an officer in the, in the schools. And, and that may be kind of shocking to you, but I, I, I know of one school where they were, they were very displeased because an officer went in to do something. I don't know what it was, but uh, he, was, he was fully dressed in uniform with a firearm. 
And the, uh, and the, the child came home and said that he was disturbed by the fact that the law, law enforcement officer had a firearm. And I guess the parent agreed because there was a complaint. So yeah, we're really caught between a rock and a hard place. A civilian may, may function quite well under those circumstances. I don't know. I don't know. Yes, it could be a civilian, absolutely. Um, we, would, we would screen the person, make sure it's the right person has the right temperament to go in the, into the schools, and uh, we would, before they go in, they gotta be certified by the LEAD program. But yes, a civilian could teach the program. We, are you leaning towards that as trying to find uh, a if, person to do that? If I have to, I will. Um, you know, right now, like I said, we got two other DARE instructors, or lead instructors. The reason I say DARE, I was a DARE instructor for 10 years. But the lead program has, uh, <laughs> so the lead program, in my eyes, has taken over the DARE program, 110%. Um, so, you know, we'll make sure that, you know, we get, whether it's a deputy or a civilian into the schools, the LEAD program will be moving forward, absolutely. Other questions? Hello, Justin Will, for sure. Um, I, this can go to House or Senate, does it matter on your account? Um, it's probably going to go to the Senate, but okay. it depends on your question. Great. Uh, I think it works for both, uh, so we'll direct it toward you gentlemen. Um, given all these crises that we're talking out about, they're compounding. I mean, you got the fentanyl in the schools, the racism in the streets, um, not to mention inflation and the ongoing <coughs> pandemic. It's, a, it's not an exaggeration to say it's a scary time to bring kids into the, into the world. Um, but a long-term trend in Vermont is that population was declining. And COVID seems to be a little bit of a bump where me and a lot of other millennials moved here. Um, but we're only going to bring down the average age of the state for a little bit. Um, what we need are new Vermonters. So what policies can you enact from the Senate or let laws that can help boost the, uh, the local newborn Vermonter population? And we're going to start with Mark. Well, I've been going, going around for year after year doing this. And two years ago, when I went door to door, what I learned was that there were people moving from the usual places, Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, coming here to Vermont because of COVID. That's why they came here. They didn't come here because we had a state program. They came here because this was a good place to live during COVID. And we were getting more broadband access, so it made it possible to work here. I've worked hard on broadband and helped pass a couple of laws that made EC Fiber a viable entity and got um, world-class service to people's homes. That's my plug on this one. Um, that's one of the things we do. But people were coming here because of COVID. This year, I've been out and trying to understand the new towns that I'm running for office in, like Bradford, so I been pushy. I said, well, how long have you lived here? Where'd you come from? And I've been astounded, absolutely astounded to hear California, Washington State, Utah, Colorado, not the usual suspects. And why are you coming here? Fires, fires, fires. No, Arizona, the dam is almost out of water. We're going to sell our house now while we can get some money for it. And we're coming here to Vermont. Why? Well, Vermont's been ranked as one of the best states to live in in, with, in the global warming atmosphere. This is the place to arrive. I went to, knocking on doors on Route 5. Five houses in a row were for west of the Mississippi that were climate, climate refugees. Now, that's why they're coming here, and that was new to me, and I think it's, it's Vermonters are picking up on this now. But the consequences... The consequences. Um, the, we had the housing commissioner in talking about housing and growth of housing. And she said, you know, Vermont's incomes have gone up 16% in the last two, Thank you. two years. But the cost of housing has gone up 29%. So 
The income isn't covering it. Um, I'm going to switch over to John. Okay. So I welcome the question because we're dealing with it a lot. And you're actually hitting a couple of different issues. One is about young people. The other is about flatlanders. And um, I try to bridge that divide because I was conceived in Vermont and born in Connecticut. So I don't know when flatlander begins. Um, but I've been called a flatlander since I was a kid. And I embrace people who move here who share our values. And you know we don't need a, a nativism um, you know, exclusivity of people. But I've hit on the farming. I'll hit on it again. We hear about how we import $1.5 billion worth of energy when I guess the solution is to buy billions of dollars worth of products manufactured in China, solar panels and EV cars. That aren't made. That's not how you grow an economy. If we, what I'm finding is intriguing is that we have a lot of young people, maybe thousands moving here who want to raise sheep and pigs and other animals. I mean, they're really out there. Um, well, there are a lot of other young people moving here who work off their laptops and a whole change in the economy. And they want to buy local foods that are grass-fed, that are free of chemicals for their children. We also have, someone mentioned current use. Current use is now being abused in a way. Uh, hedge funds and others take advantage of it to actually tie land up that it, so it can't be used for farming. And sequestering carbon in trees is really not very helpful. Grasslands sequester more carbon. So we need more farmland. We, the, the worse the fuel prices get, and they are limited resources, and they will only go higher with or without ongoing inflation. And fertilizer prices have tripled in the last two years for all. That's going to filter through the food prices. Young people want to move here not because they get offered 10 grand, but because they want to raise their children in a clean environment. And we need both sides. But also, the, um, the real estate taxes are very high. And that's very high for all of us. And that's in part because they're regressive, because they put our education costs on real estate. If that's not that's not helpful. And we're closing schools under the second, uh, when adjusted for income, the second highest school cost in the country. Well, nobody wants to move to Chelsea if they have to bust their kids an hour to go to school. So when you lose your local schools, and we've lost like 30% of our students, then you're, you're not supporting young people. So we need to bring everybody together to the table to grow the real economy, not grow the government, which siphons off wealth and makes it harder and harder for young people to live here. This relates to the, uh, Dina Du Bois, Corinne, relates to global warming. And um, I'm glad that Vermont is part of um, the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and I wanted to know about divesting from fossil fuels in the pension system. And Samantha, I believe you've been involved with the pension thing, so maybe Carl would like to add to that. Um, we'll, go, we'll start with House, and Samantha's up first. Um, yeah, so I um, proposed a pension plan to my committee. I am on um, House Government Operations, where we oversee pensions, elections, charter changes. Um, we oversaw some of the election law. And we also um, were part of another um, um, constitution change that will be on your ballot um, about removing slavery from our, um, from our constitution. And I voted yes for that, uh, for, for that record part as well. Um, and so I, su I supported a pension plan um, I, I promoted um, that would allow the, the person holding the plan to be able to make a decision what they would like to do with their plan. Um, and that for me going forward is that our pension plan is still hemorrhaging. It's not okay. It, it's, it's still in a really bad place. And teachers and state employees, for your corrections officers, your highway personnel, um, and your teachers, they're all... Got, we got something taken away from them they were promised. They either have to work longer, they're making less, they have a higher COLA, and that's not acceptable. You took a job and you knew what you were going to be paid, and that's what you should be getting. I did, when my proposal came forward, it was anybody coming in would have a new system that they could choose. Um, you know, they could have a defined contribution plan, which they can allow them to choose, an annuity, a safe harbor. You can make the choice of where your money is being invested, because right now the state's doing that for you. They're picking where it goes, and they're deciding. So right now, if I am a state employee, I would be doing the same thing, and they'd be managing it with someone that's about to retire. That's not okay. I should be more aggressive, and they should be more safe, because they need to be able to have that when they retire. So I fully support that someone in the pension plan should be able to make their own decision, um, and that did not move forward. The governor took my plan that I wanted, and he said that's what he wanted. 
and he vetoed um, the pension plan that we had, and I did not support the veto. I just went with what we had because it was a step in the right direction. Um, and it was very hard going against my own proposal, but I did for the better of Vermont to be able to go forward. But we did have four hours also for that of community hearings um, that I was proud to be a part of. But I agree that you should be able to choose how your money is invested and what it's supporting. We shouldn't be doing that for you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question, Dina. Uh, I, I, this is not a, a subject that I am well versed on at all. Um, I know that there was some uh, question about this, um, and that this is something that the treasurer needs to be involved in, in the organizations that deal with the pension funds. Um, but I, you know, I would support looking at it. I don't, I don't know uh, what the ins and outs of, ins and outs of it would be. Um, but I would support looking at it and I would support uh, talking with the treasurer, next treasurer, about um, how we move forward to, to do some of that. Um, and I want to be get back to Mark's question. Uh, Mark, yes, uh, I believe that Joe Biden was the legally and lawfully elected president of the United States and I also believe in the separation of church and state. In the back. Hi, my name is Paula Lavelli. I'm from East Brent. Um, when this gentleman was talking about um, work burning for his house, this Ms. Lefebvre, um, you said that the government should not be telling you how to eat your home. I agree, 100%. I also think that the government should not tell a woman what they can or cannot do to their body. And he was kind of sidestepped when this question has been brought up previously. Can you question directed to the candidates and not to one person? Thank okay. You. Can everybody on this board tell me yes or no, codify Roe v. Wade? Um, codify. Not sure I would understand the question. Can you just re-ask it? Roe v. Wade. <clears throat> Quantify it. There's been talk about quantifying it so it becomes forever. You don't? Know? You mean make it law? Is yes. that what you're asking to make Roe v. Wade yes. law? Okay. Um, just so want to make sure I answer right. right. yes or no. Um, so I'm going to give this to the Senate and we'll start with John. So that's a really intriguing question and thank you for asking. In fact, I was controversial in the Republican Party's statewide meeting this year when someone tried to introduce an amendment requiring that all Republicans oppose abortion from conception. And I stood up, I didn't go there to speak, but I stood up and I said, are you trying to eject me from this party? We have no business trying to do such a thing. What's intriguing about Roe versus Wade is that its repeal did not impact Vermonters. We have the um, aforementioned laws here protecting the right of a woman to have an abortion up until delivery. Even though 90% of Americans oppose late-term abortions and 72% in a recent poll oppose abortions after 15 weeks. Ban uh, France bans it after 20 weeks. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg foretold the Dobbs decision very insightfully. If you read it, it sounds like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So what's intriguing about that is that Roe recognized fetal personhood and viability. And Vermont does not have a law protecting a pregnant woman whose child is killed by an assailant or a drunk driver. And it doesn't seem that that's very balanced. So codifying Roe versus Wade would actually put it back in the middle. And I think you're also talking about whether it would be done on a state level. In, in Vermont, we're not going to lose a woman's right to commit an abortion. The question is whether, uh, and, and Samantha's right, Proposal 5 is very broad language. But existing laws fully protect that. There's no question. There's no push by any significant number of people trying to take away those rights. So codifying Roe versus Wade would actually resurrect the issue, although Casey took that away, of fetal personhood, which I think that's the balance that most Americans speak to. Um, and, and, so, and actually, this brings back to something Mark said, is that there's no red-blue divide in Vermont's legislature. That's because there's no red. There are only six Republican senators, I believe. Um, so, you know, uh, you know and, and back to your thing, I mean, I'm the young guy. No, I don't want to be guilty of ageism here, but I'm like, you know, I'm the young guy. So I, I've actually been very outspoken that I have no intention, in fact, that nobody has business running in Vermont 
if they were to try to ban abortion from conception, whatever our personal views would be. But similarly, on the other side of framing, the vast majority of Vermonters don't support late-term abortions. Roe versus Wade cut that baby in half from a Solomonian perspective. Oh, I can speak? Sorry, yeah, please. Yeah, you can have the rest of my time. I won't live that long enough. <laughs> well, then I, I guess I don't need to. No, sorry, I do hope you do. Thank you. I do hope you do, Mark. Um, the question is about Roe versus Wade being put into law. The vote that Vermonters have before them on November is to put what is close to Roe versus Wade into the Constitution and to say that laws will not be turned on and turned off um, on a woman's right to make decisions for herself. Um, this state does a terrific job of working together, solving problems having to do with bread and butter issues, having to do with in the legislature. We have problems when we have cultural wars introduced into campaigns And we don't, we don't usually do that in Vermont. The last time we did that was, was uh, civil unions. And um, that was a remarkably respectful period of time in the legislature among the citizens who had serious concerns and were worried that terrible things were going to happen. And that cultural war was resolved after civil unions passed and marriage passed. And all the dire consequences that we, that people were afraid of, didn't happen. Yeah. So, the constitutional amendment before you on November, for the citizens of the state of Vermont to decide is: Shall government tell women what to do when it comes to their health concerns, or will be women be free to follow their conscience, their religious teachings? their doctor's advice, or their family's counsel, and then make a decision for themselves. That's all it does, and it's high time that it happened. Any other, okay. I wanted to make sure I get everybody else before I went back to Shorty, sure. so thank you. I'd just like to deepen this question of, um, we only have a few minutes left. Yeah, I know. So I just want to deepen this question and ask a question, which is I would like to read the one sentence of Article 22 of personal reproductive liberty. That an individual right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity um, to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed. That sounds really good. Unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. This to me seems pretty ambiguous and I wonder if that last phrase, excuse me, uh, a justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means is in an ambiguous enough to actually take away the very guarantee of reproductive autonomy. That's my um, So that we can finish on time, I'm going to ask you guys to keep your answers to just one minute, if you could. Sure. And it'll be the House, and it would be Carl first. Um, Barbara, my understanding of that language at the end of the uh, amendment, uh, the purpose of that is to create a very, very high bar that would have to be achieved in court to, uh, to deny a woman those rights. And I know that that's confusing for some. Um, I, would, I would recommend that anyone who's interested in that issue uh, look on Senator Ruth Hardy's website, and she g gives a very good um, uh, synopsis of the amendment and why that language is in there. It, it, it is put in there to basically create 
a very, very difficult bar for the state to meet if, if they want to overturn it. Um, thank you. And so that uh, sentence is the exact reason I voted no. To me, it, this is not getting at what I think we could be doing. Um, and it, nowhere in there does it say woman. So we're saying this is about a woman, this is about abortion. That word was not in there. This is so much more. This, um, you know, there was an article in seven days about an 11-year-old getting sex training in the state of Vermont. That's a reproductive organ. Is that reproductive right? There's so many unanswerable questions. I did not feel comfortable voting on this language. It's not that I completely oppose what we have in front of us. This is for men, women, however that you identify yourself. That's not up for me. I do not support this language because there are too many questions that have gone unanswered. I've sat at the hearings. I will listen to the committee. When my committee wasn't going, I would go to there. There's too many questions that cannot be answered. The word woman, the woman, the word abortion, abortion are not in there. We already have that right here in the state of Vermont. That is a law and that is up to the time of birth that woman has that right. That's not what this amendment is doing. Thank you. So we're gonna switch over to closing statements um, and go around again. And each statement, each candidate can speak for up to two minutes as a closing statement. Um, and we will start with um, the Senate, and Mark McDonald would be up first. Closing statement. I'm, uh, I thank you for putting this on, and I'm disappointed that we have not tackled some of the fundamental issues of problems we have before us. Um, our fossil fuel costs are high. We're using fuels that uh, don't do the environment any good. And we seek to replace and use different fuels to do common practices like heating and transportation in the hopes that it brings the costs over a period of time down for all citizens. And we have yet to craft a way to do that. We um, passed a global warming, uh, excuse me, a clean heat bill, which called upon the Global Warming Solutions Act Committee to make some recommendations on how to pay for the conversions that would help people save money and have a cleaner environment. And we have to start from scratch again next year. Um, the bill that, that was, didn't get, that was vetoed and wasn't overridden would have looked into a variety of things about um, what is the long-term, um, the long-term questions that have to be answered about electric vehicles. What is the uh, long-term about using wood for um, sequestering carbon or for burning? How do we solve these problems? Meanwhile, we're not doing anything, and um, that's disappointing. I was disappointed to read in my opponents. Yep, my opponent's uh, postcard that I had voted for a bill that never came up and never was voted on. Um, Which one's that? The allegation about having voted for uh, um, heating oil increases. Um, so I'm disappointed that we haven't asked the candidates how they would solve these problems, how we would each propose to solve the problem and make and move ahead in a. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I, I find that um, puzzling because the clean heat bill that you refer to that was re, uh, vetoed uh, by Governor Scott and then resisted by one vote and override is the one in which you specifically, I believe, called for a heating oil tax, as you've just said, to help offset the cost for people to make that conversion, that is for heat pumps. The existing net metering program takes money out of Vermonters' pockets, some of whom heat with electricity, some of whom do not live in a place that's well suited for solar panels to fund the ability of other people to get solar panels or EV cars. That is the definition in tax law and policy of regressive. All right, so it's not fair. And then the people that are able to get net metering sell it back at high rates. That's going to end. I'm going to try to push to uh, remove that. Because you can't help the, the environment if your economy is tanking. That's just fundamental. Look at the Amazon. But also, many of these ideas, however well-intentioned, uh, they're not going to work. 
uh, solar pan rooftop panels are about twice the cost per kilowatt hours as solar fields. Those solar panels are manufactured and transported here from China. They use coal to create them. They generate a lot of things other than just CO2 in their manufacture. They create all kinds of toxins and chemicals. We are looking for a, a solution instead of reducing our consumption, the number one way of which would be agriculture and buy local food and don't truck it from far away and don't fill it with chemicals so it will have a long shelf life and so that corporations make a lot of money in the processing side and then feed it to your children and wonder why they get cancer. And so my policy list has been built on making Vermont more affordable, making government smaller. The government in this state is growing in its budget so, faster than underlying incomes. And the idea that we're going to fund it with Chinese manufactured goods instead of growing our own economy, it's not long term going to actually help the environment or the economy. And so I really focus on farming, and I have a book coming out on this subject which will show that I've read about 100 books from people smarter than me to figure out some real solutions. And number one is Vermont's heritage, Vermont's culture, Vermont's economy of local, small-scale agriculture. Thank and that you. will help all of these issues. So, Madam Moderator. Well, I, I Madam said, Moderator, I disagree with him. <laughs> I, Good to know. Madam Moderator, I said I was disappointed because I hoped that the very suggestions or that my opponent has suggested would be debated here, not what well, we have. It, your we have. People can look for themselves at your record. I've yeah. shown your videos. <laughs> look at my card. Everybody here, look at my card. Just the two of us. Thank you. Um, so, uh, to recap, I, um, I'm very grateful for the ability to be able to serve you guys. Um, I take it as I work for you. I've made myself accessible, available, um, and by doing that, I've reached out on every Monday. I would tell you what my schedule for my committee looked like on Friday. I would post on Facebook, front porch forum, my email list, um, and any other way people would prefer to have it, mailed about how I voted and why, to give you the why behind it and to give you links for you to be able to follow along with what I was doing. Um, the great thing about what happened with COVID is everything's recorded. You can go online, you can watch what I did, you can watch that I was there, um, and you can look at and go back through for all the time to come to see this information. Um, there's many of you in this room that I have reached out and helped um, to be able, and, and that's what I'm grateful for. To me, this is more than a job. Um, that to me, this is, this is a, it's a very rewarding experience. Um, and I am grateful to be able to help in any way that I can. Um, part of what I did also is I um, chaperoned so that I didn't submit the bill. It was submitted through um, Office of Professional Regulation, um, but a bill that allowed compact licensing for our nurses. So that means that we can join in with other states and people can easily transfer here to come work. Uh, right now at my hospital, there's more travel nurses working with me than there are home nurses. That means that they're paying, being paid three, four times more with other support than our home nurses are, and we need the help. Um, I, as I said, I did make the proposal for a pension plan, and I also listened to the voters of Corinth who came out when we were redistricting, and that was part of my committee was to propose a new district for the entire state to match the census plan that came through. In the House, I am known as the one that will come to the middle and to hear all sides. I might be in the minority, but that doesn't mean that I do not come through to make sure that all the voices are heard and accounted for. I'm there to work for you, and that's what I continue to like to do, and that's why I'm asking for your vote to be sent back to Montpelier to represent you. Thank you. Carl? Thank you. Um, I was honored to serve as your representative in Montpelier, and I'd be honored for your vote uh, to send me back again to do the same. I, as I said before, I would like to work on the issue of uh, workforce development That's right. and, uh, and, and our housing and child care issues, which, uh, were, like I said before, we're not going to solve our workforce issues if we don't have housing and child care for people who want to come here and work. Um, when I served before, uh, I held office hours throughout the district. Um, I sent out a, a weekly newsletter during the session that let you know what I was up to and, and what I was doing. I would continue to do that. I would continue to uh, I, would also, I would also go to select board meetings um, and I would be accountable to you as the voters of the district. I, I'd work hard for you on these local issues that every town has. Um, I'd just be a phone call away and uh, I would like to thank uh, my fellow um, candidates here for being here today. I'd like to thank the moderator, Eileen, 
I'd like to thank the select board for proposing this and I'd like to thank all of you for coming here today and uh, appreciate your interest in our um, civic uh, process here and appreciate your interest in, um, uh, in this election. And uh, as I said before, um, I'd be honored to go back and, and I hope uh, all of you will vote. Your vote is your voice. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll start with Bill Bonia. Thank you. For the past 15 years, I've been sheriff, and I'll, I will continue to work with our, our towns, our select boards on these contract issues. Um, there's not a quick fix on it, I can tell you that. Uh, one town, we had a uh, plan in place for five years, increase at $5,000 a year for five years. First and second year was fine. The third year, their, their grader broke. The money went for, for the grader. So um, we'll, I will work with the select boards with, this, with the contract issues. Um, back in 2008, I created the, the Special Investigative Unit um, here in Orange County. Um, it has been in place for, you figure, almost 14 years now. Um, we investigate all sex crimes against children in a 100% standalone victim-friendly building that's in front of the Chelsea Health Center. Um, that's not owned by the county, it's owned by the Sheriff's Department. Five years ago, I brought the lead program here in Vermont, and we will continue that. Um, I'm part of the National Sheriff's Association, and through the National Sheriff's Association during the COVID program, a COVID uh, crisis, I was able to, at no charge, uh, over 100,000 masks, disposable masks, were, were given throughout Orange County and even beyond. Uh, all the sheriffs in Vermont got them. The Vermont DOC received over 20,000. Uh, hospitals, uh, first fire departments, rescue squads. Um, I've been a part of prevention partnership, restorative justice, um, racial, uh, racial disparity programs here, uh, the Randolph Rotary Sunrise Club, and for since 2011, I've been doing a weekly radio show on WCVR, um, and that'll continue uh, once the selections are done. Thank so, you. Thank you. George. Well, my interests are in revamping the contract system so that it's more viable for towns that don't have the population and uh, are, are running on small budgets. Um, secondly, I'd like to be able to look at our, our uh, budget within this, the department. Um, it's, it's kind of a vague, uh, a vague area in that even the uh, side judges don't even know what's going on in the sheriff's department. And I don't think that's good. I think that, uh, I think that we should be very, very, very open and clear to the public exactly what's happening and where we are spending our money. Are we spending our money on, on trips going somewhere? Are we spending our money on, uh, you know, different different things other than to protect and to serve? Are we spending our money on, on things that we don't need to spend our money on? Uh, we're, we're talking about, the sheriff is talking about the, this building that we have on, uh, on the north end of Chelsea. Well, I can tell you that it cost us $34,000 just to keep the old jailhouse going. And the old jailhouse was sufficient for us for eons, back three sheriffs as far as I can remember. And I have no idea what it costs us, as, as the sheriff said, coming out of our sheriff's budget, what it costs us to maintain that white building. Uh, I'm assuming it's got to be at least 50 grand. Now that's $50,000 that, that uh, would mean another patrol officer instead of that. As I said, we lived for years in the jailhouse. Why, why, are, why have we expanded? Why are we size 44 and 32 pants? We haven't got enough people. If we had more people, then and perhaps we could, you know, do better than what we do do. I know the, I know the people are irritated by not being uh, answered calls in the middle of the night. Well, that can be taken care of. I was in an outpost system for years handling five towns, never had any problem with it. If we could have a, a, a different system of contracts where we have people designated to work in certain areas, not doing other things, but designated to work in that certain areas, like Vershire, like Thetford, like West Fairley, people, you know, that haven't got contracts. Thank anyway, you. thank you very much. I appreciate your time. 
Um, I'd like to thank the Versher Select Board, our candidates for their time and for running for office, Orca Media, they're going to put this online, and to all of you for attending for your good questions and discussion. Um, please stay for some goodies afterward in the back.